co-founded Philo Records, and he's been, he was the author of three short story collections and five novels. He has served on many boards and currently chairs as, and currently chairs the Vermont College of Fine Arts, which is known for its writing programs. He speaks extensively on the arts, media, and nonprofit governance, nonprofit governance. And he writes about Vermont in fiction, humor, and opinion pieces. He's also a regular commentator and blogger on public radio. So his topic today, provocative topic, is uh, being Catholic, Jewish, and agnostic all at once. Um, so, is he there? No. Not just yet, but I'm sure okay. he'll be here momentarily. Okay, so uh, this is what he said. He'll talk about his German Jewish background, his baptism into, into the Catholic faith at age four, his love-hate relationship with Catholicism, his distinction between the Jewish faith and Israeli politics, and the questions that haunt him about religion in general. So it should be um, an interesting talk, and I hope it will begin shortly. Here he comes, he's just entering. Trumpets of Ukraine. My sincere apologies. Huh. I somehow had this all in my calendar for one o'clock. So you, you have my, my uh, real honest apologies. Well, Bill, you've been introduced. So and I actually, the floor is yours. <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, it's a real honor to be with you all today. And um, I'm, uh, what I thought I would do is just jump right in. Um, and um, if it's okay, say, you know, talk a little bit about um, my experience and, and what we had all talked about, and then um, kind of open it up for discussion and questions. So if, um, if it's okay, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go right in. Um, I'll tell you a couple of stories, um, which may be helpful to give you some context um, for my relationship to Judaism um, and community and my own family. Uh, I, I grew up in Morrisville and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that. I'll come back to that, but um, my grandmother called me at one point and said, you're going to Phillips Exeter, to which my response sort of was, what's that? And <clears throat> I learned more about it. And my wonderful stepfather, Emil Couture, drove me down and I was introduced to my roommate. And my roommate kind of looked me up and down and he said, what are you? And I said, uh, I, I beg your pardon, I don't, I don't understand. And he said, well, you know, what race, what religion? And I said, oh, I'm a Catholic. And he looked kind of disappointed. And to be polite, I said to him, and what are you? And he said, I'm a Jew. And I said, oh, what's a Jew? Now, I'm sure it's occurred to all of you that Schubert is a German Jewish name. Um, and I grew up in Morrisville, visiting my, my grandmother in New York from time to time, and had absolutely no idea what a Jew was, even though my own family 
um, were, um, I have to say, assimilationist Jews. And <clears throat> I'll come back to that. Um, the, the, a, a little bit about my own background. <clears throat> um, my father, uh, my namesake, William, <coughs> excuse me, William uh, Schubert, died before I was born in World War II in the Pacific Theater. And my mother, who was pregnant with me, was put by his family into a residential hotel, uh, the plaza, and um, told to stay there for a year um, until after I was born and they would get a nurse. And, um, after, and she did. And um, after I was born, she just began to go stir crazy. And she gathered me up, snuck out one night, went down to Penn Station, and with me all wrapped up, got on the Montrealer, which was a steam train then, got off in Waterbury, took the Couture Jitney, which was a little bus uh, to Morrisville, rented a second story apartment, and two years later married a handsome French Canadian ski instructor named Emile René Couture. Um, and not wanting to be a Schubert in the Catholic Couture family, um, I went by the name Bill Couture until I went away to school. And I was baptized into the local French Canadian um, church in Morrisville at the age of four, became an altar boy at the age of seven, and um, just was, you know, assumed that I was and always would be a Catholic. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Um, and um, then um, my, my grandmother was concerned. Um, and, and by the way, the reason that my mother went north on the Montrealer was because um, she had gone to Putney in the early days. And it's the only place she ever remembered being happy was at Putney in Vermont. So that's what brought her north. Um, anyway, my grandmother was concerned that I would be um, raised in a French <laughs> farm family and my highest aspiration would probably be to have cows. So <clears throat> she put a huge amount of pressure on my mother. Um, she, she actually at one point sued for um, for, uh, you know, that, that I would come live with her. And that all fell apart. And my stepfather, who was really one of the most wonderful people you'd ever meet, negotiated with her and set it up that I would travel twice a year to New York City um, and spend two weeks with her. And he'd bring me down to Waterbury and the southbound Washingtonian would come through and he'd, um, He'd get me on and give the porter a dollar and the porter would come in, put me in my pajamas, tuck me into my bunk and get me up the next morning, get me dressed off and take me out onto the platform to meet either my grandmother or one of her domestics. And I would spend two weeks uh, having lunch in the Russian tea room and going to the old Metropolitan Opera on Broadway and um, the Met and you know, um, and lie in my bed at night crying because I wanted to be home with my friends in Morrisville. So it was a, <clears throat> it was a very, very kind of dichotomous childhood, which at the time was really, really difficult. Um, but um, in retrospect was one of the greatest gifts I've had in my life is, you know, living kind of in an equilibrium between these two very different cultures. When I was 11, my grandmother decided I needed to see the world. So she, she took me on a cruise um, to Aruba, Bonaire, Curacao, um, Caracas, and Bogota. It was just a two week cruise. And um, I, I remember being on the ship with her and it was a Sunday and I had no way to go to church. So I was very, very upset. and. I said, finally, I just looked at her and I said, Chips, what church do you go to? 
And she looked at me equally upset, panicked almost. <clears throat> and uh, she thought for a minute, and then she said, uh, ethical culture. So <clears throat> in my 11 year old mind, I'm ticking through the white churches in Morrisville, Congregationalist, Methodist, Catholic. And I said, huh, <clears throat> where is that church? And she said, oh, it's on WQXR radio Saturday morning, at which point I was totally lost. I had no idea what she was talking about. Um, and then later on come to un came to understand that the Ethical Cultural, so Ethical Cultural Society in New York was really the place where the assimilationist Jews um, you know, found their community. And for those of you who have read the classic book, Our Crowd, <clears throat> um, about the, the New York Jewish community, the large, the great families, I was stunned when I first read it because our family was in it and a lot of the names in our family were in it. Um, the, um, oh Lord, the, the, my great uncle was Alfred Stieglitz, the photographer. So the Stieglitz family, the Kuhn family, the single S Strauss family, um, all turned out to be relatives and are all featured in that book, Our Crowd. And the interesting piece about that book, it was the Jewish community in New York was really bifurcated in the sense that the sort of aspirational Jews who really wanted to be part of the business social and more WASP culture um, wanted to be distinguished from the shtetl Jews on the Lower East Side. They were just very, very anxious to be viewed differently so that they would have access um, to what it was they wanted. There's no blame inherent in that, but it was a real interesting schism that's articulated very well in that book. Um, the um, I, you know, continued to live in Vermont. I went away to Kenyon College for a couple of years, took a year off, got married to my first wife, lived in New York City for a year and a half, working for Sam Goody for $60 a week, <clears throat> lived um, in a $78 a month apartment on the Upper East Side, and then realized um, I couldn't, I, I couldn't have a family in New York. I just couldn't afford it. Um, and my grandmother lived three, four blocks away at 71st and Park in an 18 room duplex. Um, and I could visit her, but that was, that was about it. Um, so my wife and I, and our first son who was born in New York, moved back to Burlington. And, um, uh, a second son was born. So when I was 23 years old, I was married with two children living on Pearl Street in Burlington, um, going to UVM during the day and working the night shift at IBM at night. Uh, <clears throat> and then got out of, um, when I graduated from UVM, I took the first job that was offered to me, which was teaching French at Mount Abraham Union High School in Bristol, which had just opened. And um, I asked the superintendent, I said, I'm really pleasantly surprised. Why did you hire me? He said, because you speak French. And I said, well, uh, French teachers speak French, right? And he said, not, <laughs> not your colleague. Anyway, um, I taught there for two years. And there's a story there, which I'm always, uh, I'm going to ask your forgiveness in the beginning, because it's one of those stories that, that is difficult. But I think amazingly important to hear. Um, I had a homeroom class as well as teaching seven out of eight classes a day. Um, and my kids, mostly farm kids from, you know, from Addison County, um, would all come into the classroom. And so we'd have a news hour and they were all news anchors. And I would say, okay, we're on the air. What's your news this morning? And their all hands would all go up. And, and <clears throat> this one little kid who was really a character, he just he was a farm kid and he was, he drove me a little crazy, but I loved him. I said, so <clears throat> Mike, what's your news this morning? He said, well, I just bought a new car. I said, really? You know, this is, this is a kid who's like 15, 16 years old. 
I said, that's pretty impressive. What did you get? He said, well, I got an old, old, old mobile. He said, it needs some work. And I said, how are you going to pay for that? He said, well, I'll work at the Grand Union after school. I said, okay, so, so well, that's good to know. I said, uh, most, most kids can't afford a car at your age. And he said, oh, it's okay. He said, I jewed him down. So I was like, whoa. And I said, so let me ask you a question, Mike, because it felt like a teachable moment to me. I said, let me ask you a question, Mike. I said, you're, you're in one of my classes. Is Jew a verb or a noun? And he thought for a minute and he said, well, I, I guess it would have to be a verb. And I said, so what would you say if I told you I was a Jew? And he thought for a minute, looked a little confused and he said, Oh, he said, you get good deals on cars. And I, I just, you know, obviously I was shocked, but there was so little knowledge of Judaism in Vermont outside of the Burlington community and, and Rutland to a degree in Brattleboro that I realized, you know, this was, and, and Michael didn't have an anti-Semitic bone in his body. He just was naive. Anyway, um, that really sort of drove home the, the whole issue for me. Um, I, I gave up on Catholicism. I, when I went to Exeter, I, we all had to attend church on Sunday and I was, I was asked which Catholic church in Exeter I wanted to go to. And that surprised me. I said, well, what do you mean? And they said, well, we have a Polish one, an Irish one, and a French one. And I thought, well, wait a second. I mean, Catholic, I don't get it. So I, you know, having come from a French family, I chose the, the French one and went there. And, and then um, in my senior year, my roommate and I designed a class for ourselves to essentially read all of the Russian literature, pre-revolutionary Russian literature um, in translation. And our teacher was Colin F.N. Irving, John Irving's father. John was a year um, ahead of me there. <clears throat> and he was the best teacher I've ever had in my life. And we did. We read, you know, Turgenev, Pushkin, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, <clears throat> everybody. And when I read the Brothers Karamazov, I'm sure some of you are familiar with The Legend of the Grand Inquisitor which is a very short story inside um, the Brothers Karamazov. I read it two or three times and I went back and I walked away from Catholicism and I never went back. And if you haven't read it, um, I, I won't paraphrase it for you other than to say it's one of the most marvelous pieces of literature ever written. It's um, Christ comes back during the Inquisition and he is walking through the streets of Seville and identifying himself as Christ and said he's come back as he promised. And he's finally arrested by the Grand Inquisitor um, who's head of the Catholic Church and he's put in jail. And the Inquisitor comes in and explains to him why he's been jailed. He said, I know you're Jesus Christ. He said, and I'm head of the church. And he said, you made a terrible mistake. He said, when you were in the desert and the devil offered you the three gifts of miracle, turning stones to bread um, and um, authority, um, control over men's conscience, conscience, conscience and, um, and world domination, you laughed and you said, I want men to follow me by freedom. And he said, you underestimated mankind. He said, so we, the church, have taken the gifts of the devil and we know we will be condemned forever, but we will save mankind by damning ourselves, by using those three gifts. And Christ leans over and kisses him. I mean, it's just, it's a staggering story. And that story stayed with me forever. And throughout my life, I, <clears throat> um, I have had three really close friends who are Catholic priests. And 
even when I left the church, they, they never tried to get me back into the church, but we stayed very, very good friends. One was my childhood priest, Father Omer Dufo, who was legendary in the Catholic Church. And um, <clears throat> I once told him, he said, why did you leave the church? And I told him the story, but I didn't, I, I didn't go into the story of the legend of the Grand Inquisitor. We stayed friends over the years. And shortly before he died, every couple of months, I would take him out to lunch. And we'd always talk about what we were reading. And I remember our last conversation was, at what point does the accretion of wealth go from being a respectable obligation to care for one's family and one's community to a mortal sin? What, at what point does that cross over? <clears throat> and, um, you know, we talked about that for a while. And then I said, so what are you reading? And he said, I just read a really, really beautiful book. Really beautiful book. And I said, what did you read? And he looked at me and he said, A Legend of the Grand Inquisitor. He said, I get it now after all these years. And I just was like, I just was stunned. Um, my other friend I met in a treatment facility when I was in my early 40s, I weighed just shy of 500 pounds. The only way I could weigh myself was to go to Agway and climb on an old Fairbanks Morse grain scale and weigh myself. And I went down to this facility. It was not a fancy facility. It was sort of alcoholics on the left, eating disorders straight ahead, uh, opiates on the right. And um, I was there for a month and learned an awful lot about addiction. And a priest came in on a gurney, Father Bob, who weighed 800 pounds. And I was assigned to sort of be his partner and be a friend of his. And, and he looked at me and he said, they keep telling me I'm so fat. He said, do I look fat to you? He said, I don't feel fat. And at that point, I realized, I understood how the eating disorder you know, anorexia, bulimia, and just simply overeating. I understood the power of it and the, the, the deceptive capacity of addiction, the ability to believe that you're massively overweight when in fact you're dying of anorexia or, you know, that you're an appropriate weight when you weigh 800 pounds. And he and I stayed friends for a couple of years and then he died. Um, not unexpectedly. Um, the other friend was a priest who had been with Thomas Merton at Gethsemane. He graduated um, from Cornell, was an Olympic skull champion. Um, his family were high Episcopalian from uh, Lancaster, PA, and he became a Catholic and joined the, the monastery in Gethsemane. I was there 10 years and after 10 years there was a change in the order and people were given the opportunity to leave which he took and he became the spiritual advisor to the trap family in Stowe and immediately had a ferocious head-on battle with the Baroness who I, I knew really well and um, I, I'm struggling in my old age to always be kind and accurate but it's hard for me to summon anything positive to say about the Baroness. Anyway, she threw um, Father Dodge out and um, our local priest, Father Dufo, called up my mother and said, hey, have you got a room that Father Dodge could stay in until he gets settled? He wasn't giving up the priesthood. He just was giving up um, the order at Gethsemane, which was a Trappist order. And <clears throat> he moved into our basement and stayed there for four years. So he was a lifelong family friend as well and was very active in the international children's villages, the SOS Kinderdorf. Uh, he tried to start one in the United States. And the United States today, I think, is the only country in the world that doesn't have. These were orphanages start after, started after World War II, built around the family structure. Um, anyway, um, I stayed very, very close to those, those priests and um, just... Um, you know, have, have always had, as I said, sort of in the introduction, this real flirtation with Judaism, um, Catholicism, 
agnosticism. Um, and my wife, Kate, goes to the local church cool. here in Heinsburg, the United uh, Church. And I'm not a member of that, although I've gone with her a couple of times. And the minister there, Jared Hamilton, who's a really wonderful man, has twice asked me to deliver um, what he calls reflections. Um, they're sort of like a lay homily or something. And, and I have with great pleasure. Um, and I, 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 I was left with this love-hate relationship of the Catholic Church. Um, I was appalled, obviously, like the rest of the world, with the whole issue of pedophilia, um, the church's handling of it. Um, and, um, and yet, you know, it's been an integral part of my own life. So I just, I still struggle with it. And I'm, I've always been fascinated by Judaism. I've always wanted to go to Israel. In fact, very good friends of ours, uh, <clears throat> who, um, one of whom is Jewish and the other of whom has converted to Judaism, um, were out for dinner, um, it was two years ago. And um, we were having a, a wonderful conversation. They'd just come back from Israel and, um, they were talking about, you know, really how wonderful it was. They, they were just thrilled with everything they saw. And I said, you know, I really would love to go there. I said, I'm struggling um, because I, I, I just really have issues with um, some Israeli politics, especially um, those surrounding Netanyahu. And I sort of got this stony look. And... Um, and then there was a comment that indicated that they felt that what I had said was anti-Semitic. So I said, listen, we've been friends for a really long time. I need you to give me the space to revere Judaism, the religion, but to differentiate it from any judgment I might have about Israeli politics. And she looked at me and she said, you can't. They're one and the same. And I didn't know what to do at that point. The conversation just came to a screeching halt. We sort of had dessert, stared at each other, and, um, and that was it. Um, I'm, I, I, I have a great reverence um, for religions and churches. Um, I see communities like yours. Um, you know, I see Catholic communities, I see Protestant communities doing really, becoming, you know, a community for doing great good, for solidarity, for being together, for discussion, study. Um, and as I said, for, for just doing great good. And I think that is so vital. Um, and then the other side of me, in my, in my darker moments, um, when I look at the, the world's major religions, I realize how many of them have been perverted to man's purpose. They, they have had to look away from the divine to man's purpose. And it goes right to that issue in, in um, The Legend of the Grand Inquisitor. And I wrote a book recently called The Priest, um, which really explores much of what I'm talking about um, you know, in, in much the same way. And in doing the research for that, I found out some amazing stuff within the Catholic Church that, <clears throat> um, you know, Mary Magdalene was essentially by the Desert Fathers in the fifth and sixth century or fourth and fifth centuries, um, was really considered an apostle. She was considered a disciple and a friend of Christ. And as the church began to worry about the influence of women in the church, um, I think it was Leo V, um, don't hold me to that, but it was one of the popes, delivered a scathing sermon on Mary Magdalene as a reformed prostitute. And that characterization of her does not occur in any church literature until that sermon. At which point that has, has remained kind of a truism that, that Mary Magdalene was a reformed prostitute. 
um, you know, the whole issue of selling plenary indulgences. And um, the other intriguing thing to me is that uh, Catholic priests were allowed to marry until the 11th century. <clears throat> and then there was this grave concern because instead of when they died, instead of leaving all their possessions to the church, they were leaving them to their family. So a, a decision was made in Rome that if you wanted to be a priest, you couldn't marry. So, <clears throat> and these are all kind of subtle examples of, of how, um, how mankind in all religions, I mean, I was having breakfast just a couple of days ago with a friend of mine who's a Buddhist. And I said, so talk to me about Myanmar. She said, that's not Buddhism. And you know, she's right. Um, but but how, how specifically men, not mankind, men have worked to pervert the spiritual course of religion to their own advantage and to give them more power over women. Um, and that's changing in many ways, thank God. Um, but anyway, that's, you know, that's part of this, this whole kind of thing that I struggle with spiritually um, about all the beauty and good that religions accomplish and what happens when they go wrong. I mean, we saw it in Atlanta two days ago, you know, this, this 20 year old kid, you know, who is worried about his sex addiction, addiction. So he goes out and kills the people that he's been using. It's, you know, it's just troubling. Um, one of the films that I saw recently, I don't know if there's any of you seen it, but it, it so well articulates my love-hate thing with the Catholic Church. It's called The Two Popes. And it's essentially <clears throat> about Pope Francis, who is a breath of fresh air in the church and doing the best he can, um, and Benedict. Um, and and how they meet and talk about their ideological difference. It's a wonderful film, very, very enlightening. Um, <clears throat> and I'll, I'll wind up um, by talking about um, another experience. The two, at 75 years old, the two drivers in my life um, are, I want to maintain an ability to love. And that includes everybody. And um, so it, it forces me to think hard about empathy. Um, I actually had a weird dream one night um, where I dreamt, and I ended up writing it up. It's, it's not worth anything. I mean, I, I write for publication, obviously, but this is, was sort of very personal. But it was, I'm imagining President Trump in a large bed in the White House alone with the TV on, <clears throat> lonely, insecure, afraid. Um, and all of that, of course, whenever I see somebody who's arrogant, I understand that what's underlying that is insecurity and fear. Um, you know, with an abusive father, a remote and distant mother, and all of a sudden, I imagine Trump in this very sort of empathetic, you know, um, this, this poor child. Um, anyway, um, the other thing is gratitude. Um, because I was overweight all my life, I was always told, you know, by very well-meaning, loving people, family members, doctors, everybody, you know, <clears throat> you just need to plan to be dead by the age of 50. You can't weigh as much as you do and live past the age of 50. And so I, even after I lost weight, I knew that I would not live past 50. And, and at 75, it becomes very easy to cultivate gratitude. Um, I'm in good health. The only medicine I take is a, an occasional statin. Uh, I love hard work. I do a lot of work in the woods. Um, but I want to say a bit more about gratitude. <clears throat> um, when my brother and I started a recording studio in the 70s in a record company called Fano Records, um, <clears throat> which um, 
I'm sure Brian Lloyd will remember and, and uh, Catherine. So um, one of the artists we recorded was a blind street singer in Manhattan who sang for 10 years with her partner um, who was a woman. It wasn't a sexual relationship. They were just two blind women who sang together under the awning at Bloomingdale's on 59th. And <clears throat> Bloomingdale's tolerated her there. In fact, they let her sing under the awning because she sang year round. And um, somebody sent me a cassette of some of her stuff and I had never heard music like this. It was really very, very unusual, very primitive, um, fabulous metaphors like the royal telephone to Jesus. Um, and so I did a little bit more research and uh, went down to see them, heard them, and to make a long story short, brought them up to Vermont, <clears throat> recorded them. Um, we had to bathe Virginia. She had not had a bath in five years. Um, and we, we recorded them and I often left the machines running because baby loved to talk and she did. And we produced the album and I took it down and, <clears throat> and um, brought her a whole box of them so she could sell them. And we had it, we went out to dinner and had a nice time. And then um, the following Sunday, she said, would you like to come to my service? And I said, oh, do you have a church? And she said, well, kind of. So she gave me an address in bed -Stuy. And in those days, white people just simply didn't go to bed -Stuy. It's very gentrified now. And I've stayed there just a couple of years ago. Um, but back then it was unheard of. And when I got into a cab in Manhattan and said, I want you to take me to this address in bed -Stuy, he said, no, you don't. And I said, yes, I do. And I went out there and <clears throat> there was a concrete step leading down under an abandoned building and a sign in the window saying that it was baby service. So I went down and there were six blind people sitting in chairs. And baby was behind a handmade lectern. And she asked me, since they were all blind, if I would go in and find the donuts and bring them out um, and bring the coffee urn out, which I did. <clears throat> the donuts were covered um, with bugs, which I shook off um, and brought them out. And Baby delivered a sermon that has never left me. Baby was born, um, when she was born, the doctor who delivered her was drunk. And in those days, um, sexually transmitted diseases were so prevalent that, that a doctor delivering a newborn would wash the eyes out of the newborn with boric acid because the child coming down the vaginal, um, the, the vaginal tunnel could pick up in their eyes um, these diseases. The doctor was drunk and he used the acid that he used to clean his hypodermics and blinded her and knew he had done that and um, the mother had gone into a deep hemorrhage, um, which he managed to staunch. And then when she came to, he said, I'm really sorry, but your daughter was born blind and he left. So um, baby's father was non-existent. Um, her mother, her mother um, was, um, died and she was sent to an orphanage in Kansas. Um, and which she loved. And that's where she learned to sing and, and play the piano. Um, and so she, she then was fostered out to a family in Kansas and middle of nowhere and was put on a train with a little thing saying, I'm going to this place. These people are picking me up. I'm a foster child. And they did. And at 13, she was impregnated by the foster father. The foster mother blamed it all on her saying she'd vamped him. And baby was then sent to the Kansas City Home for the Blind. And she went there and she continued to learn more about music. Um, and then she um, and a friend she met there, Virginia Brown, um, took a bus to New York City where she got an exhorter's license. 
And an exhorter is the lowest form of religious license you can get in, at that time in New York. Um, and that enabled her to sing on the street um, and to exhort. And she did for all these years. Anyway, years later, this, this sermon that she gave in this tiny little basement in Brooklyn has stuck with me. After everything you just heard, her sermon was on gratitude and how she had everything in the world to be grateful for. And she was, in her own words, the happiest woman. And this is not a woman who was delusional. She was incredibly bright, amazingly well-read. She actually taught French for a brief while at the Lighthouse in New York. Um, and for her to sit there and me to sit there in that basement and listen to her talk about how overwhelmed she was with gratitude, that was formative in my own spirituality. So again, um, I'll, I'll stop there. Um, the, um, there, there are other things I could talk with you about, but I don't want to do all the talking, which is what I usually do. And I see it's already kind of one, so I apologize. Let me open it up for what's left, if anyone has questions or thoughts. Oh, okay. Yeah. If you, if you have a question, just unmute. <clears throat> I'd be happy to answer it if I can. Um. I see Roger Gillum, an old friend. <laughs> Bill, among your just can you hear me, Bill? Bill, you do not mention your relationship with God in any of this. I'm sorry, my relationship with? God in any of your discussions. You talk about relationships within the churches. Yeah. But God is left out. That's a really, it, that's a really, that's exactly the right question. And the reality is I struggle with that and I, I, um, I would have to describe myself as an agnostic. I mean, I've had, um, I've had enough experience with religion, uh, uh, many religions, actually. Um, Freddie Beekner was a teacher of mine at Exeter, and taught a, a, you know, a wonderful world-class in religion. Um, but the honest answer is I don't know. And the thing we, you know, what we call recovering Catholics often joke about is the contingent act of contrition. In other words, you say, well, I don't know if I believe in God, I'm sure, I, you, know, uh, you know, and then all of a sudden you're hit by a truck and you're lying, dying in a gutter. And you quickly say, oh my God, I'm heartily sorry for having offended me. <laughs> that if you can't get to confession, <laughs> you say an act of contrition. Um, so I, I don't have an answer. I wish I did. Thank you. Other questions or thoughts or challenges? And it's wonderful to see you. Well, it's wonderful to see you too. And is that Sandy next to you? Hi. There's a number of familiar faces, which is wonderful. Hi, my name, my name is Basha Brody, yeah. um, and I was interested when we were talking about your upbringing in Morrisville, mm -hmm. um, you're talking about Morrisville, Vermont, um, yeah. because I taught a people's academy for many, many, many years. Oh my gosh. And what was interesting, um, I being Jewish was one thing, and I was also, and I'm also a lesbian, there were, at my tenure there of 14 years, there was at least eight faculty and staff members who were from the lesbian, gay, and transgender community. And I was the only one in the whole district that was Jewish. Yeah. 
So I had far more acceptance being a lesbian than I had being Jewish, which I always thought was really interesting. That's really interesting. I, I mean, I'm sure you remember, I can't remember her name. She was one of the most wonderful people. She was a math teacher in high school who was what we used to call a Boston Mother, which is a discreet lesbian relationship. And there was, um, there was not, you know, people didn't talk about gay relationships, but there were many. And you and I could name a number of them in Morrisville, but they weren't in your face and they weren't self-declaratory. Um, the term I remember so well for the lesbian community was a Boston marriage. Mm. This, this yeah, so I had much more difficulty, like at, at the beginning, getting off holidays than I did with, and 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 I felt far more protected as a lesbian around my job than mm -hmm. I did about anything else Jewish, which was um, interesting to me. Oh, sure. I mean, now it's not that way, but in the beginning, when I was teaching there in the early uh, '90s, that was true. And there was a lot, and still is, um, some major anti-Semitism in that community. Yeah, yeah. That's my grandmother, um, Elise, on my stepfather's side, Elise Couture, who lived to be 101, remembers the Ku Klux Klan in Morrisville riding through town. And she said it was ridiculous because there were no Black people, there were no Jewish people. So the best they could do was the few Irish and the French Canadian but we all depended on each other economically. So they just ride around with their silly sheets, kind of not knowing what to do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have to go, but thank you for your uh, presentation. Well, very nice to meet you. Stay well. Any last thoughts or comments? I didn't catch, I don't know if you said, but I didn't catch when you found out you were a Jew. Because it sounded like when you went to Exeter, you didn't even know what a Jew was, but okay. you you did know you know you had spent a lot of time with your grandmother. So I, I was curious when that I, happened. My grandmother um, was the epitome of an assimilationist Jew. <clears throat> she did not want anyone to know she was Jewish, um, so it never came up in our family at all. Um, and um, in fact. I remember <clears throat> her offering um, nose reconstruction surgery to her daughter who accepted it, um, my aunt, Diana Heller, and um, to my cousin, whom I revered, who was a photographer in the Stieglitz tradition um, and photographed a lot of great artists. And um, she just laughed at her. He said, my nose is my nose and you're not going to take it from me. But it was, that's how assimilationist it was. There were people, I mean, I knew kids at Exeter who changed their name. Um, um, my brother-in-law's name was Nicholas Freund. And he came back one year and his, his next year, his name was Nicholas Dean, D-E-A-N-A. -E and my best friend there, um, Barry, I can't remember his Jewish name, but um, he did the same thing in his senior year because he wanted to go to Harvard and he did not want to be known as a Jew. So he changed his name to Barry Wilder. So how did you find out that you were a Jew? Pardon? How did you I did, find I out? Know I, was, I didn't even know what a Jew was or that I was one until I was 13 and went away to Exeter and had that exact experience. Um, you know, and, and, and honestly said to that person, what's a Jew? So, um, Bill, yeah. um, Alfred Stieglitz married... Um, Georgia. Oh, Georgia. Pardon, pardon me? Are, are you talking about his first marriage or his second marriage? No, no, his second marriage. Georgia O'Keefe. Georgia O'Keefe. So did you, did you know her? I did, but <clears throat> that's like, it, it's, a, it's a deceptive statement. When I was in New York visiting my grandmother, Georgia was often there because they were great friends. But at this point, Stieglitz was, <clears throat> was living in 
although he, Stieglitz died in 46, so I never knew him. But um, um, Giorgio had moved out west, but she and my grandmother were very close friends and painted together until they, she died. Um, in fact, the only three portraits, Giorgio O'Keefe did four portraits and three of them were of my grandmother. Mm. Um, and um, she would be there in the apartment, but <clears throat> Georgia's perception of children was like bad furniture. And, you know, I could sit there and say, oh, um, Miss O'Keefe, you know, and she'd kind of look around, did somebody say something? I mean, Georgia was not about kids, trust me. So I can't say I know Georgia O'Keefe. <laughs> but I can say that I sat in the same room with her a lot. <laughs> May I, Bill? Yeah. Hi, it's Mary Beth Bowman. Hi. Of course. I, I have a, a similar uh, story. I'm from a farm in Minnesota, um, Irish Catholic. I went to a 15 years of Catholic education. My college, there were a number of Jewish teachers in theology. Uh -huh. and it was like after that, I could not believe. I, I remember walking down Lake Michigan crying. I can't believe, I don't believe, I don't believe. So, and here I am, Jairish. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so I, and coming to Judaism felt like I'm home. This, this is where I'm supposed to be. So it was, a, it was a little rough on everybody on, on Irish Ridge Road there. But, but they, uh -huh. you know, they accepted it and here I am. So, so well, I understand, I understand your... Well, I think the, the, the route that we travel to our own spirituality, for many of us, it goes through several religions. For some, it ends up deeply. I actually find myself with immense respect and affinity for several religions. And yet I haven't found what I would consider to be a home in any one. And yet I feel comfortable in all of them. Um, I, <clears throat> um, in my last book, I used the local priest in Heinsberg, Father Cray, as a critical reader and we became really good friends. Um, and um, so I, I revere those friendships and again, just have an immense respect for my own roots and um, those of many of my friends. So. Any last thoughts or questions? Well, if there I aren't any a, more questions. Wait, I have a question. Okay. <clears throat> Judy Rosenstrike. Unmute myself. Um, Bill, um, this is a change in the subject, um, but I'm interested in in uh, the question of leadership. So um, in, your, in your experience being the chair of, the, of a variety of boards, which I don't need to go into, uh, we all know what they are or some of us do and you know, um, this requires leadership. And um, you've talked about your background and your grandmother and so on, but um, could you talk about leadership and um, what you feel, you, you, do you feel that you are a leader? I mean, I feel that way, but do you feel you're a leader? And what elements in your personality made you a leader? Um, well, it's very kind of you to say that I'm a leader. It's not my place to say that I'm a leader. I, I think one, one is a leader if somebody else says they're a leader. Um, <clears throat> I think the most important element of leadership, and I've talked a lot about this, is humility, is having a deep understanding of what you don't know and not being focused on <clears throat> what you do because, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the complexities of leadership is that it's four or five or six job descriptions. And anyone who is a leader knows what they're capable of and what they're not. For example, in business, somebody can be a marketing leader. They can be a finance leader. They can be an intellectual property leader. They can be an operations leader. 
Um, they can be a human resources leader, but very few leaders can, can exercise more than one or two of those job descriptions. So what they do, a true leader, is they don't go out and find their buddies or people who are going to always be there for them. They go out and find the best leaders they can in their field, <clears throat> bring them together, listen to them, give them the authority to lead. That to me is, 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 the, is the most critical issue is humility and knowing what you don't know. Yeah, no, I think that's, um, if I can just uh, carry this on, I mean, you could devote a whole talk to the question of leadership. Yeah. But um, from what I can see, um, uh, I think um, by yesterday, I think the uh, U.S. Senate had confirmed uh, 19 uh, agency heads um, selected by President Biden. So... Um, to me, um, of the ones, you know, I, I follow this pretty closely, and um, each one has, um, you know, exhibits um, pretty extraordinary expertise and a high caliber in their particular area of expertise. So I think that from what you're saying, um, the president of the United States, in order to be a good leader, has to have such individuals. And he knows that they know more than he does in these various fields. So wouldn't you, would you agree that that is um, what we're seeing evolving is leadership? I think, I think very much so. What's really troubling to me is, <clears throat> I, I mean, I, over the 75 years that I've been on the earth, I've seen, you know, polarity and I've seen tribal division and so on and so forth, but <clears throat> I've never seen it to the extent that it is today. Um, and it may be my not knowing enough about history. We've had the know nothing movement. We've had, you know, all kinds of racist movements in our history. And in fact, they're, they're integral to our history. Um, but I'm amazed at the capacity for self-delusion. Um, I think one of the most striking things I've ever seen was the nurse in North Dakota during the pandemic crisis talking about the patient she had who was actively doing the work of dying and screaming at the nurse saying, you're lying to me. There's no such thing as COVID. What, why am I sick? What is it? Why are you lying to me? And I mean, if there's ever an existential moment, it is the moment where we are dying. And this woman was absolutely convinced that everyone was lying to her. And I thought, my God, I had, I just didn't realize the capacity for self-delusion that we, we have. And it's, it's, that, that troubles me. I'm very worried about social media. Um, I, um, I understand its value. I understand that it makes it possible for many of us who are older to stay in touch with family. Um, you know, we have foreign exchange students every right. year. We had one last year from Moldova. Every Sunday, she'd talk to her mother in Italy and her father in Moldova. And we have a young woman coming this fall from Serbia who will go to CVU. And, you know, we get on the phone, and, you know, chat with her. It doesn't cost anything. When I was a kid, it cost a couple of bucks to call from Morrisville to Waterbury. Right. You know? right. So I get the value, but I'm also terrified about its capacity to become a machine for self-delusion. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So do you, do you want to just come and at any other, in other aspect of the pandemic, because it's not over. Um, oh, I, I know that I know that I myself are, um, uh, you know, although I'm fully vaccinated and so on, um, it's going to be a, a challenge to kind of move back into, 
you know, um, old ways. I, I don't see myself doing that very easily. I, I, so I think that's the, the easiest question you've posed me. There are two ways to look at the pandemic. One is I can't wait to get back to the way it was. And the other question is, what has it taught us yeah. that we can bring forward into the future? And I think that's the critical question. I mean, I've been doing an awful lot of work with um, heads of colleges about what's the future of higher ed going to look like and the future of public education. And, you know, uh, in fact, I chair the Vermont College of Fine Arts in, in Montpelier, and we've always been low residency, but we're looking at like, how has this changed? What what is going to be different and what's going to be better and what do we need to learn rather than how soon can we get back to the way it was? That to me is the only real question. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much okay. for coming. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I agree. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah. And um, we will be together again, our Lunch and Learn group uh, next month. So please stay tuned for, um, for information about that. Thank you so much, Bill. Well, I learned a lot from just being with you. So thank you all very much. Great. Stay well, and uh, we'll visit again someday. Okay, thank you. Bye, everyone. Question, is this, is the, are these recorded Zoom sessions? Yeah. Yes, this will be recorded and it will be put on the Ojavi Tzedek YouTube channel. And I can send an email to Judy um, and let her know that it's up there, um, if that's helpful. Thank you, more than, more than helpful. Great, okay. Um, I see that Aaron has his hand up. He, he might want, does he want to say something? I was hoping to ask one more question, but if time's run out, I'll, I'll, I'll I can call Bill, uh, but it's, is there enough time or not? Sarah? I Sarah? I think Bill might have left, actually. Oh. Okay. Okay. <laughs> it's all right. I'll catch up with him. Thank you very okay. much. Okay. Thank you. Bye, Bye, everyone. Thanks, Raj. You're welcome. Hi, Brian. Thank you for coming. It's wonderful. Just wonderful to see you. Wonderful to see Bill and hear his story. You bet. It was great. Talk to you soon. <laughs>